Section forty three of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Chapter seven. Containing a remark or two of our own, and many more of the good company assembled in the kitchen. Though the pride of Partridge did not submit to acknowledge himself a servant, yet he condescended in most particulars to imitate the manners of that rank. One instance of this was, his greatly magnifying the fortune of his companion, as he called Jones, such as a general custom with all servants among strangers, as none of them would willingly be thought the attendant on a beggar. For the higher the situation of the master is, the higher consequently is that of the man in his own opinion. The truth of which observation appears from the behaviour of all the footmen of the nobility. But, though title and fortune communicate a splendour all around them, and the footmen of quality and of estate think themselves entitled to a part of that respect which is paid to the quality and estate of their masters, it is clearly otherwise with regard to virtue and understanding. These advantages are strictly personal, and swallow themselves all the respect which is paid to them. To say the truth, this is so very little, that they cannot well afford to let any others partake with them. As these, therefore, reflect no honour on the domestic, so neither is he at all dishonoured by the most deplorable want of both in his master. Indeed, it is otherwise in the want of what is called virtue in a mistress, the consequence of which we have before seen. For in this dishonour there is a kind of contagion, which, like that of poverty, communicates itself to all who approach it. Now for these reasons we are not to wonder that servants, I mean among the men only, should have so great regard for the reputation of the wealth of their masters, and little or none at all for their character in other points, and that, though they would be ashamed to be the footmen of a beggar, they are not so to attend upon a rogue or a blockhead, and do consequently make no scruple to spread the fame of the iniquities and follies of their said masters as far as possible, and this often with great humour and merriment. In reality, a footman is often a wit as well as a bow, at the expense of the gentleman whose livery he wears. After Partridge, therefore, had enlarged greatly on the vast fortune to which Mr. Jones was heir, he very freely communicated an apprehension, which he had begun to conceive the day before, and for which, as we hinted at that very time, the behaviour of Jones seemed to have furnished a sufficient foundation. In short, he was now pretty well confirmed in an opinion that his master was out of his wits, with which opinion he very bluntly acquainted the good company round the fire. With this sentiment the puppet-show man immediately coincided. "'I own,' said he, "'the gentleman surprised me very much when he talked so absurdly about puppet-shows. It is indeed hardly to be conceived that any man in his senses should be so much mistaken. What you say now accounts very well for all his monstrous notions. Poor gentleman! I am heartily concerned for him. Indeed, he hath a strange wildness about his eyes, which I took notice of before, though I did not mention it. The landlord agreed with this last assertion, and likewise claimed the sagacity of having observed it. And certainly, added he, it must be so, for no one but a madman would have thought of leaving so good a house to ramble about the country at that time of night. The excise man, pulling his pipe from his mouth, said, He thought the gentleman looked and talked a little wildly, and then, turning to Partridge, if he be a madman, says he, he should not be suffered to travel thus about the country, for possibly he may do some mischief. It is a pity he was not secured and sent home to his relations. Now some conceits of this kind were likewise lurking in the mind of Partridge, for as he was now persuaded that Jones had run away from Mr. Allworthy, he promised himself the highest rewards if he could by any means convey him back. But fear of Jones, of whose fierceness and strength he had seen, and indeed felt, some instances, had, however, represented any such scheme as impossible to be executed, and had discouraged him from applying himself to form any regular plan for the purpose. But no sooner did he hear the sentiments of the exciseman than he embraced that opportunity of declaring his own, and expressed a hearty wish that such a matter could be brought about. "'Could be brought about,' says the exciseman. "'Why, there is nothing easier.' "'Ah, sir,' answered Partridge, "'you don't know what a devil of a fellow he is. "'He can take me up with one hand "'and throw me out at window. "'And he would, too, if he did but imagine. "'Poh!' says the exciseman. "'I believe I am as good a man as he. "'Besides, here are five of us.' 
"'I don't know what five, cries the landlady, "'my husband shall have nothing to do in it, "'nor shall any violent hands be laid upon anybody in my house. "'The young gentleman is as pretty a young gentleman "'as ever I saw in my life, "'and I believe he is no more mad than any of us. "'What do you tell of his having a wild look with his eyes? "'They are the prettiest eyes I ever saw, "'and he hath the prettiest look with them, "'and a very modest civil young man he is.' I am sure I have bepitied him heartily ever since the gentleman there in the corner told us he was crossed in love. Certainly that is enough to make any man, especially such a sweet young gentleman as he is, to look a little otherwise than he did before. Lady, indeed! What the devil would the lady have better than such a handsome man with a great estate? I suppose she is one of your quality folks, one of your townly ladies that we saw last night in the puppet show, who don't know what they would be at. The attorney's clerk likewise declared he would have no concern in the business without the advice of counsel. Suppose, says he, an action of false imprisonment should be brought against us, what defence could we make? Who knows what may be sufficient evidence of madness to a jury? But I only speak upon my own account, for it don't look well for a lawyer to be concerned in these matters, unless it be as a lawyer. Juries are always less favourable to us than to other people. I don't, therefore, dissuade you, Mr. Thompson, to the exciseman nor the gentleman, nor anybody else. The exciseman shook his head at this speech, and the puppet-show man said, Madness was sometimes a difficult matter for a jury to decide, for I remember, says he, I was once present at a trial of madness, where twenty witnesses swore that the person was as mad as a March hare, and twenty others that he was as much in his senses as any man in England. And indeed it was the opinion of most people, that it was only a trick of his relations to rob the poor man of his right. "'Very likely,' cries the landlady. "'I myself knew a poor gentleman who was kept in a madhouse all his life by his family, and they enjoyed his estate. But it did them no good, for though the law gave it to them, it was the right of another.' "'Puh!' cries the clerk, with great contempt. "'Who hath any right but what the law gives them? If the law gave me the best estate in the country, I should never trouble myself much who had the right.' "'If it be so,' says Partridge, "'Felix quem faciunt aliena pericula cautum.' My landlord, who had been called out by the arrival of a horseman at the gate, now returned into the kitchen, and with an affrighted countenance cried out, "'What do you think, gentlemen? The rebels have given the duke the slip, and are got almost to London. It is certainly true, for a man on horseback just now told me so.' "'I am glad of it with all my heart,' cries Partridge. "'Then there will be no fighting in these parts.' "'I am glad,' cries the clerk, "'for a better reason, for I would always have right take place.' "'Ay, but,' answered the landlord, "'I have heard some people say this man hath no right.' "'I will prove the contrary in a moment,' cries the clerk. "'If my father dies seized of a right, "'do you mind me seized of a right, I say? "'Doth not that right descend to his son, "'and doth not one right descend as well as another?' "'But how can he have any right to make us papishes?' said the landlord. "'Never fear that,' cries Partridge. "'As to the matter of right, the gentleman there hath proved it as clear as the sun.' and as to the matter of religion it is quite out of the case the papists themselves don't expect any such thing a popish priest whom i know very well and who was a very honest man told me upon his word and honour they had no such design and another priest of my acquaintance said the landlady hath told me the same thing but my husband is always so afraid of papishes i know a great many papishes that are a very honest sort of people and spend their money very freely and it is always a maxim with me that one man's money is as good as another's. "'Very true, mistress,' said the puppet-show man. "'I don't care what religion comes, provided the Presbyterians are not uppermost, for they are enemies to puppet-shows.' "'And so you would sacrifice your religion to your interest,' cries the exciseman, "'and are desirous to see popery brought in, are you?' "'Not I, truly,' answered the other. "'I hate popery as much as any man, but yet it is a comfort to one that one should be able to live under it, which I could not do among Presbyterians. To be sure, every man values his livelihood first. That must be granted, and I warrant, if you would confess the truth, you are more afraid of losing your place than anything else. But neither fear, friend, there will be an excise under another government as well as under this. Why, certainly, replied the excise man, I should be a very ill man if I did not honour the king whose bread I eat. That is no more than natural, as a man may say, for what signifies it to me that there would be an excise office under another government, since my friends would be out, and I could expect no better than to follow them? No, no, friend, I shall never be bubbled out of my religion in hopes only of keeping my place under another government, for I should certainly be no better, and very probably might be worse. 
"'Why, that is what I say,' cries the landlord. "'Whenever folks say, who knows what may happen? "'Ah, Sooks, should I not be a blockhead to lend my money to who I know not who, "'because mayhap he may return it again? "'I am sure it is safe in my own bureau, and there I will keep it.' "'The attorney's clerk had taken a great fancy to the sagacity of Partridge. "'Whether this proceeded from the great discernment which the former had into men, as well as things, "'or whether it arose from the sympathy between their minds,' for they were both truly Jacobites in principle, they now shook hands heartily, and drank bumpers of strong beer to healths which we think proper to bury in oblivion. These healths were afterwards pledged by all present, and even by my landlord himself, though reluctantly. But he could not withstand the menaces of the clerk, who swore he would never set his foot within his house again if he refused. The bumpers which were swallowed on this occasion soon put an end to the conversation. Here, therefore, we will put an end to the chapter." Chapter Eight, in which Fortune seems to have been in a better humour with Jones than we have hitherto seen her. As there is no wholesomer, so perhaps there are few stronger sleeping potions than fatigue. Of this Jones might be said to have taken a very large dose, and it operated very forcibly upon him. He had already slept nine hours, and might have slept longer had he not been awakened by a most violent noise at his chamber door, where the sound of many heavy blows was accompanied with many exclamations of murder. Jones presently leapt from his bed, where he found the master of the puppet-show belabouring the back and ribs of his poor Mary Andrew, without either mercy or moderation. Jones instantly interposed on behalf of the suffering party, and pinned the insulting conqueror up to the wall, for the puppet-show man was no more able to contend with Jones than the poor party-coloured jester had been to contend with this puppet-man. But though the Mary Andrew was a little fellow, and not very strong, he had nevertheless some collar about him. He therefore no sooner found himself delivered from his enemy, than he began to attack him with the only weapon at which was his equal. From this he first discharged a volley of general abusive words, and thence proceeded to some particular accusations. "'Damn your blood, you rascal,' says he. "'I have not only supported you, for to me you owe all the money you get, but I have saved you from the gallows. Did you not want to rob the lady of her fine riding habit no longer ago than yesterday, in the back lane there?' "'Can you deny that you wish to have her alone in a wood to strip her, "'to strip one of the prettiest ladies that ever was seen in the world? "'And here you have fallen upon me, and have almost murdered me, "'for doing no harm to a girl as willing as myself, "'only because she likes me better than you.' "'Jones no sooner heard this than he quitted the master, "'laying on him at the same time the most violent injunctions of forbearance "'from any further insult on the Mary Andrew, "'and then taking the poor wretch with him into his own apartment.' He soon learned tidings of his Sophia, whom the fellow, as he was attending his master with his drum the day before, had seen pass by. He easily prevailed with the lad to show him the exact place, and then, having summoned Partridge, he departed with the utmost expedition. It was almost eight of the clock before all matters could be got ready for his departure, for Partridge was not in any haste, nor could the reckoning be presently adjusted, and when both these were settled and over, Jones could not quit the place before he had perfectly reconciled all differences between the master and the man. When this was happily accomplished, he set forwards, and was by the trusty Mary Andrew conducted to the spot by which Sophia had passed, and then, having handsomely rewarded his conductor, he again pushed on with the utmost eagerness, being highly delighted with the extraordinary manner in which he received his intelligence. Of this Partridge was no sooner acquainted than he, with great earnestness, began to prophesy, and assured Jones that he would certainly have good success in the end, for, he said, two such accidents could never have happened to direct him after his mistress, if Providence had not designed to bring them together at last. And this was the first time that Jones lent any attention to the superstitious doctrines of his companion. They had not gone above two miles when a violent storm of rain overtook them, and as they happened to be at the same time in sight of an alehouse, Partridge, with much earnest entreaty, prevailed with Jones to enter and weather the storm. Hunger is an enemy, if indeed it may be called one, which partakes more of the English than of the French disposition. For though you subdue this never so often, it will always rally again in time. And so it did with Partridge, who was no sooner arrived within the kitchen than he began to ask the same questions which he had asked the night before. The consequence of this was an excellent cold shine being produced upon the table, upon which not only Partridge but Jones himself made a very hearty breakfast, though the latter began to grow again uneasy, as the people of the house could give him no fresh information concerning Sophia. Their meal being over, Jones was again preparing to sally, notwithstanding the violence of the storm still continued, 
but Partridge begged heartily for another mug, and at last, casting his eyes on a lad at the fire who had entered into the kitchen, and who at that instant was looking as earnestly at him, he turned suddenly to Jones and cried, "'Master, give me your hand. A single mug shan't serve the turn this bout. Why, here's more news of Madame Sophia come to town. The boy standing by the fire is the very lad that rode before her. I can swear to my own plaster on his face.' "'Heavens bless you, sir!' cries the boy. "'It is your own plaster, sure enough. "'I shall have always reason to remember your goodness, "'for it hath almost cured me.' "'At these words Jones started from his chair, "'and bidding the boy follow him immediately, "'departed from the kitchen into a private apartment. "'For so delicate was he with regard to Sophia "'that he never willingly mentioned her name "'in the presence of many people, "'and though he had, as it were, from the overflowings of his heart, "'given Sophia as a toast among the officers, "'where he thought it was impossible she should have been known, Yet, even there the reader may remember how difficultly he was prevailed upon to mention her surname. Hard, therefore, was it, and perhaps in the opinion of many sagacious readers, very absurd and monstrous, that he should principally owe his present misfortune to the supposed want of that delicacy with which he was so abounded. For, in reality, Sophia was much more offended at the freedoms which she thought— and not without good reason, he had taken with her name and character, than at any freedoms in which, under his present circumstances, he had indulged himself with the person of another woman. And to say truth, I believe honour could never have prevailed on her to leave Upton without her seeing Jones, had it not been for those two strong instances of the levity in his behaviour, so void of respect, and indeed so highly inconsistent with any degree of love and tenderness in great and delicate minds." But so matters fell out, and so I must relate them, and if any reader is shocked at their appearing unnatural, I cannot help it. I must remind such persons that I am not writing a system, but a history, and I am not obliged to reconcile every matter to the received notions concerning truth and nature. But if this was never so easy to do, perhaps it might be more prudent in me to avoid it. For instance, as the fact at present before us now stands, without any comment of mine upon it, though it may at first sight offend some readers, yet, upon more mature consideration, it must please all, for wise and good men may consider what happened to Jones at Upton as a just punishment for his wickedness with regard to women, of which it was indeed the immediate consequence, and silly and bad persons may comfort themselves in their vices by flattering their own hearts that the characters of men are rather owing to accident than to virtue." Now, perhaps, the reflections which we should be here inclined to draw would alike contradict both of these conclusions, and would show that these incidents contribute only to confirm the great, useful, and uncommon doctrine which it is the purpose of this whole work to inculcate, and which we must not fill up our pages by frequently repeating, as an ordinary parson fills his sermon by repeating his text at the end of every paragraph. We are contented that it must appear, however unhappily Sophia had erred in her opinion of Jones, she had sufficient reason for her opinion, since, I believe, every other young lady would, in her situation, have erred in the same manner. Nay, had she followed her lover at this very time, and had entered this very alehouse the moment he was departed from it, she would have found the landlord as well acquainted with her name and person as the wench at Upton had appeared to be. For while Jones was examining his boy in whispers in an inner room, Partridge, who had no such delicacy in this disposition, was in the kitchen very openly catechizing the other guide who had attended Mrs. Fitzpatrick, by which means the landlord, whose ears were open on all such occasions, became perfectly well acquainted with the tumble of Sophia from her horse, etc., with the mistake concerning Jenny Cameron, with the many consequences of the punch, and, in short, with almost everything which had happened at the inn whence we despatched our ladies in a coach and six when we last took our leaves of them. CHAPTER Nine, CONTAINING LITTLE MORE THAN A FEW ODD OBSERVATIONS Jones had been absent a full half-hour, when he returned into the kitchen in a hurry, desiring the landlord to let him know that instant what was to pay. And now the concern which Partridge felt at being obliged to quit the warm chimney-corner and a cup of excellent liquor was somewhat compensated by hearing that he was to proceed no farther on foot, for Jones, by golden arguments, had prevailed with the boy to attend him back to the inn whither he had before conducted Sophia. But to this, however, the lad consented, upon condition that the other guide would wait for him at the alehouse, because, as the landlord at Upton was an intimate acquaintance of the landlord at Gloucester, it might some time or other come to the ears of the latter that his horses had been let to more than one person, and so the boy might be brought to account for money which he wisely intended to put in his own pocket. We were obliged to mention this circumstance, trifling as it may seem, 
since it retarded Mr. Jones a considerable time in his setting out, for the honesty of this latter boy was somewhat high, that is, somewhat high-priced, and would indeed have cost Jones very dear, had not Partridge, who, as we have said, was a very cunning fellow, artfully thrown in half a crown to be spent at that very alehouse, while the boy was waiting for his companion. This half-crown the landlord no sooner got scent of, than he opened after it with such vehement and persuasive outcry, that the boy was soon overcome, and consented to take half a crown more for his stay. Here we cannot help observing that as there is so much of the policy in the lowest life, Great men often overvalue themselves on those refinements in imposture, in which they are frequently excelled by some of the lowest of the human species. The horses being now produced, Jones directly leapt into the side-saddle on which his dear Sophia had rid. The lad, indeed, very civilly offered him the use of his, but he chose the side-saddle, probably because it was softer. Partridge, however, though full as effeminate as Jones, could not bear the thoughts of degrading his manhood. He therefore accepted the boy's offer. And now, Jones being mounted on the side-saddle of his Sophia, the boy on that of Mrs. Honour, and Partridge bestriding the third horse, they set forwards on their journey, and within four hours arrived at the inn where the reader hath already spent so much time. Partridge was in very high spirits during the whole way, and often mentioned to Jones the many good omens of his future success, which had lately befriended him, and which the reader, without being the least superstitious, must allow to have been particularly fortunate. Partridge was, moreover, better pleased with the present pursuit of his companion than he had been with his pursuit of glory, and from these very omens which assured the pedagogue of success, he likewise first acquired a clear idea of the amour between Jones and Sophia, to which he had before given very little attention, as he had originally taken a wrong scent concerning the reasons of Jones's departure, and as to what happened at Upton he was too much frightened just before and after his leaving that place, to draw any other conclusions from thence than that poor Jones was a downright madman, a conceit which was not at all disagreeable to the opinion he before had of his extraordinary wildness, of which, he thought, his behaviour on their quitting Gloucester so well justified all the accounts he had formerly received. He was now, however, pretty well satisfied with his present expedition, and henceforth began to conceive much worthier sentiments of his friend's understanding. The clock had just struck three when they arrived, and Jones immediately bespoke post-horses, but unluckily there was not a horse to be procured in the whole place, which the reader will not wonder at when he considers the hurry in which the whole nation, and especially this part of it, was at this time engaged, when expresses were passing and repassing every hour of the day and night. Jones endeavoured all he could to prevail with his former guide to escort him to Coventry, but he was inexorable. While he was arguing with the boy in the inn-yard, a person came up to him, and saluting him by name, inquired how all the good family did in Somersetshire. And now Jones, casting his eyes upon this person, presently discovered him to be Mr. Dowling, the lawyer with whom he had dined at Gloucester, and with much courtesy returned the salutation. Dowling very earnestly pressed Mr. Jones to go no further that night, and backed his solicitations with many unanswerable arguments, such as that it was almost dark, that the roads were very dirty, and that he would be able to travel much better by daylight, with many others equally good, some of which Jones had probably suggested to himself before. But as they were then ineffectual, so they were still, and he continued resolute in his design, even though he should be obliged to set out on foot. When the good attorney found he could not prevail on Jones to stay, he as strenuously applied himself to persuade the guide to accompany him. He urged many motives to induce him to undertake this short journey, and at last concluded with saying, do you think the gentleman won't very well reward you for your trouble? Two to one are odds at every other thing as well as at football, but the advantage which this united force hath in persuasion or entreaty must have been visible to a curious observer, for he must have often seen that when a father, a master, a wife, or any other person in authority have stoutly adhered to a denial against all the reasons which a single man could produce, they have afterwards yielded to the repetition of the same sentiments by a second or third person who hath undertaken the cause, without attempting to advance anything new in its behalf. And hence, perhaps, proceeds the phrase of seconding an argument or a motion, and the great consequence this is of in all assemblies of public debate. Hence, likewise, probably it is, that in our courts of law we often hear a learned gentleman, generally a sergeant, repeating for an hour together what another learned gentleman, who spoke just before him, had been saying. Instead of accounting for this, we shall proceed in our usual manner to exemplify it in the conduct of the lad above mentioned, who submitted to the persuasions of Mr. Dowling, and promised once more to admit Jones into his side-saddle, 
but insisted on first giving the poor creatures a good bait, saying, they had travelled a great way, and had been rid very hard. Indeed, this caution of the boy was needless, for Jones, notwithstanding his hurry and impatience, would have ordered this of himself, for he by no means agreed with the opinion of those who consider animals as mere machines, and when they bury their spurs in the belly of their horse, imagine the spur and the horse to have an equal capacity of feeling pain. While the beasts were eating their corn, or rather were supposed to eat it, for as the boy was taking care of himself in the kitchen, the ostler took great care that his corn should not be consumed in the stable. Mr. Jones, at the earnest desire of Mr. Dowling, accompanied that gentleman into his room, where they sat down together over a bottle of wine. CHAPTER X. IN WHICH MR. JONES AND MR. DOWLING DRINK A BOTTLE TOGETHER Mr. Dowling, pouring out a glass of wine, named the health of the good squire Allworthy, adding, "'If you please, sir, we will likewise remember his nephew and heir, the young squire. "'Come, sir, here is Mr. Blifil to you, a very pretty young gentleman, "'and who, I dare swear, will hereafter make a very considerable figure in his country. "'I have a borough for him myself in my eye.' "'Sir,' answered Jones, "'I am convinced you don't intend to affront me, "'so I shall not resent it, "'but I promise you, "'you have joined two persons very improperly together, "'for one is the glory of the human species, "'and the other is a rascal who dishonours the name of man.' "'Dowling stared at this. "'He said he thought both the gentlemen "'had a very unexceptionable character. "'As for Squire Allworthy himself,' says he, "'I never had the happiness to see him, "'but all the world talks of his goodness.' And indeed, as to the young gentleman, I never saw him but once, when I carried him the news of the loss of his mother, and then I was so hurried, and drove, and tore with the multiplicity of business, that I had hardly time to converse with him. But he looked so like a very honest gentleman, and behaved himself so prettily, that I protest I never was more delighted with any gentleman since I was born. "'I don't wonder,' answered Jones, "'that he should impose in you.' that he should impose upon you in so short an acquaintance, for he hath the cunning of the devil himself, and you may live with him many years without discovering him. I was bred up with him from my infancy, and we were hardly ever asunder, but it is very lately only that I have discovered half the villainy which is in him. I own I never greatly liked him. I thought he wanted that generosity of spirit, which is the sure foundation of all that is great and noble in human nature. I saw a selfishness in him long ago which I despised, but it is lately, very lately, that I have found him capable of the basest and blackest designs, for indeed I have at last found out that he hath taken an advantage of the openness of my own temper, and hath concerted the deepest project, by a long train of wicked artifice, to work my ruin, which at last he hath effected. Ay, ay, cries Dowling, I protest, then, it is a pity such a person should inherit the great estate of your uncle Allworthy. Alas, sir, cries Jones, you do me an honour to which I have no title. It is true, indeed, his goodness once allowed me the liberty of calling him by a much nearer name. But as this was only a voluntary act of goodness, I can complain of no injustice when he thinks proper to deprive me of this honour, since the loss cannot be more unmerited than the gift originally was. I assure you, sir, I am no relation of Mr. Allworthy, and if the world, who are incapable of setting a true value on his virtue, should think in his behaviour to me he hath dealt hardly by a relation— they do an injustice to the best of men, for I— But I ask your pardon. I shall trouble you with no particulars relating to myself. Only, as you seem to think me a relation of Mr. Allworthy, I thought it proper to set you right in a matter that might draw some censors upon him, which I promise you I would rather lose my life than give occasion to. I protest, sir, cried Dowling, you talk very much like a man of honour, but instead of giving me any trouble, I protest it would give me great pleasure to know how you came to be thought a relation of Mr. Allworthy's if you are not. Your horses won't be ready this half-hour, and as you have sufficient opportunity, I wish you would tell me how all that happened, for I protest it seems very surprising that you should pass for a relation of a gentleman without being so. Jones, who in the compliance of his disposition, though not in his prudence, a little resembled his lovely Sophia, was easily prevailed on to satisfy Mr. Dowling's curiosity by relating the history of his birth and education, which he did like Othello. Even from his boyish years to the very moment he was bad to tell, the which to hear Dowling, like Desdemona, did seriously incline. He swore twas strange, twas passing strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. Mr. Dowling was indeed very greatly affected with this relation, for he had not divested himself of humanity by being an attorney. Indeed, nothing is more unjust than to carry our prejudices against a profession into private life 
and to borrow our idea of a man from our opinion of his calling. Habit, it is true, lessens the horror of those actions which the profession makes necessary, and consequently habitual. But in all other instances, nature works in men of all professions alike, nay, perhaps even more strongly with those who give her, as it were, a holiday, when they are following their ordinary business. A butcher, I make no doubt, would feel compunction at the slaughter of a fine horse. And though a surgeon can feel no pain in cutting off a limb, I have known him compassionate a man in a fit of the gout. The common hangman, who hath stretched the necks of hundreds, is known to have trembled at his first operation on a head, and the very professors of human bloodshedding, who in their trade of war butcher thousands, not only of their fellow professors, but often of women and children, without remorse. Even these, I say, in times of peace, when drums and trumpets are laid aside, often lay aside all their ferocity, and become very gentle members of civil society. In the same manner an attorney may feel all the miseries and distresses of his fellow-creatures, provided he happens not to be concerned against them. Jones, as the reader knows, was yet unacquainted with the very black colours in which he had been represented to Mr. Allworthy, and as to other matters he did not show them in the most dis and as to other matters, he did not show them in the most disadvantageous light, for though he was unwilling to cast any blame on his former friend and patron, yet he was not very desirous of heaping too much upon himself. Dowling therefore observed, and not without reason, that very ill offices must have been done him by somebody. For certainly, cries he, the squire would never have disinherited you only for a few faults, which any young gentleman might have committed. Indeed, I cannot properly say disinherited, for to be sure by law you cannot claim as heir." That's certain. That nobody need go to counsel for. Yet when a gentleman has ha yet when a gentleman had in a manner adopted you thus as his own son, you might reasonably have expected some very considerable part, if not the whole. Nay, if you had expected the whole, I should not have blamed you, for certainly all men are for getting as much as they can, and they are not to be blamed on that account. Indeed you wrong me, said Jones. I should have been contented with very little. I never had any view upon Mr. Allworthy's fortune. Nay, I believe I may truly say I never once considered what he could or might give me. This I solemnly declare, if he had done a prejudice to his nephew in my favour, I would have undone it again. I had rather enjoy my own mind than the fortune of another man. What is the poor pride arising from a magnificent house, a numerous equipage, a splendid table, and from all the other advantages or appearances of fortune, compared to the warm, solid content, the swelling satisfaction, the thrilling transports, and the exulting triumphs which a good mind enjoys, in the contemplation of a generous, virtuous, noble, benevolent action? I envy not Blifil in the prospect of his wealth, nor shall I envy him in the position of it. I would not think myself a rascal half an hour to exchange situations." I believe, indeed, Mr. Blifil suspected me of the views you mention, and I suppose these suspicions, as they arose from the baseness of his own heart, so they occasioned his baseness to me. But, I thank heaven, I know, I feel, I feel my innocence, my friend. I would not part with that feeling for the world, for as long as I know I have never done, nor even designed an injury to any being whatever. Pone me pigris ubi nulla campis, arbor esteva recreator aura, quod latus mundi nebulae malusque Jupiter urgit. Pone sub curu nimium propinqui solis in terra dominibus negata, dulce ridentem lalagen amabo dulce loquentem. Place me where never summer breeze unbinds the glebe or warms the trees, where ever lowering clouds appear, and angry Jove deforms the inclement year. Place me beneath the burning ray, where rolls the rapid car of day. Love and the nymph shall charm my toils, the nymph who sweetly speaks and sweetly smiles. Mr. Francis He then filled a bumper of wine, and drunk it off to the health of his dear Lalage, and filling Dowling's glass likewise up to the brim, insisted on his pledging him. Why, then, here's Miss Lalage's health. With all my heart, cries Dowling. I have heard her toasted often, I protest, though I never saw her, but they say she is extremely handsome. Though the Latin was not the only part of this speech which Dowling did not perfectly understand, yet there was somewhat in it that made a very strong impression on him. And though he endeavoured by winking, nodding, sneering, and grinning, to hide the impression from Jones, for we are as often ashamed of thinking right as of thinking wrong, it is certain that he secretly approved as much of his sentiments as he understood and really felt a very strong impulse of compassion for him. 
but we may possibly take some other opportunity of commenting upon this, especially if we should happen to meet Mr. Dowling any more in the course of our history. At present we are obliged to take our leave of that gentleman a little abruptly, in imitation of Mr. Jones, who was no sooner informed by Partridge that his horses were ready, than he deposited his reckoning, wished his companion a good night, mounted, and set forward towards Coventry, though the night was dark, and it just then began to rain very hard. End of section 43 Recording by Kalinda in Raymond, New Hampshire, on November 30th, 2007